Thank you so much, um, Fermin, Irene, and the ANA team for having me here. I must concur with my fellow speakers. Um, when we were briefed for the session, I think I also found it very challenging um, because, of course, this is we're we're very accustomed as architects to talking about our work, but not as comfortable, I would say, um, talking about ourselves. And for myself also, I think my own history is certainly full of fragments. Um, and the, the structure of this presentation, as you will see, is also very much reflective of that. It is about a piecing together of fragments. So I'm Sumeya Valley. Um, I'm from Johannesburg, South Africa. I was born and raised, as you heard, in Pretoria. My name means to rise to the occasion. It's from the Arabic root word samaya, which means to elevate or to rise. And my background um, is hybrid. So I'm from South Africa, but my grandparents came from India to South Africa, and I now live between Johannesburg and London. Um, my name, as you can hear, is Arabic, and my, um, I am Muslim, and my ancestors also were, um, which is a complex history if we think about India today, but also around the time that my grandparents came. And so the presentation today is structured in the form of three love letters. Um, the first one is to Johannesburg, the second one is to architecture, and the third one is to young architects, um, particularly to my younger self. I'm going to start with a short introduction to Johannesburg, and I hope that you get a little bit of a sense to our practice there. We need to ask ourselves if the world around us is being made in our image, and if it isn't, whose image is it being made of, and how do we start to make our own? When people are excluded or when stories are erased, it's a ravage of culture, a whole generation of thought that could have evolved out of that. My biggest inspiration is Joburg for all of its energy, all of its challenges, and all of its opportunities, the softness that there is in the quality of light, which I think is something really special about the city. I spent big amounts of my childhood in my grandfather's store in inner city Joburg. And I vividly remember walking the streets of Joburg as a child and really being in love with it from a very young age. It is a place of so many other places, movements, cultures, and different forces. People have found ways to make the city home. I think it's a testament to how resilient people are. When we were invited to make a submission for the pavilion, I really wanted to reflect what someone like me from our context and from our part of the world could bring to this pavilion. And I think that's something that Joburg has given me, or something that I strive for in my work, is always trying to read beneath the surface. And I really wanted to reflect a London that is plural and that is about many different places that honors voices from many different times, past, present, and future. The role of an architect is to be able to absorb, reflect, and translate who we are into the world. We need to be able to listen deeply to these silences and whispers. There's a whole set of worlds that are waiting to happen inside of them. I often think about our identities and how different the world looks from different perspectives. Our architecture is slanted in a very particular worldview that is very limited. And so I think that understanding how our different ways of being manifest differently visually 
and then starting to explore what that can mean for architecture. My ambitions around building are very much about reimagining structures so that they reflect who we are. And we need to do that now. So um, I hope you got a small sense of my city. Uh, I visit it once a month, but I still miss it very much. And it is everything about who I am and the way that I see the world. Um, when we started talking today, uh, I mentioned that um, my own background is very fragmented, and I also don't know so much about it. So I was looking over um, at my colleague with some envy to see photographs of your grandmother and that you know um, that your history is documented in some way, which is a privilege and a blessing, and you're very blessed for that. I am enormously blessed to be here today, to be... Um, at the liberty and at the luxury of asking these questions and even reflecting autobiographically in itself. Recently, one of my friends asked me to write um, a letter for a publication of his. And um, the publication was about letters crossing the Indian Ocean. So he asked a series of people to write letters to each other, uh, explaining how their families landed in different countries in Africa um, and how they crossed the Indian Ocean. And I received a really beautiful letter from a woman who described in great detail a love story of people who met and crossed the ocean and survived to be together, the, the story weaved together, indentured labor and very difficult histories and very beautiful histories as well. And of course, I in return had to write a letter to the next person. I was at home at the time. It was um, July this year and I was celebrating Eid with my family at home in Pretoria where I grew up. And I asked my parents, even though I knew the answer, why my grandfather came to South Africa. And um, they looked at me a little bit perplexed, and they said, for a better life. And I said, yes, I know, but that's why all people migrate. <laughs> that is, in fact, why I also am a migrant at the moment. Why specifically did he say he came to South Africa? And um, we worked out what year it was. It was just before partition in India. Um, and I asked my mom, didn't you ever think to ask why my grandfather wanted to come to South Africa? And, uh, you, actually, he was sent alone on a ship when he was six years old by his parents. Um, and she said, we never thought to ask. And that's why I just want to reground myself here and say that we are enormously lucky that we have the privilege of being able to ask these questions, and even the fact that I have the privilege to ask these questions of my parents is an enormous privilege. Sometimes being able to piece together history from fragments is also a strength, and I deeply believe that if we don't have archives that are already constructed, being able to construct archives from other places, from places that are overlooked, from places that are sometimes perceived as silent is a great strength. Um, and my practice is very much based on that. So the next little video is somewhat of an oral experience that describes the piecing together of fragments. We may not play the whole thing, um, but let's maybe just start. <laughs> Tisi kilometer ko habasi ba unha kai uis kai apa ke kupunga kurus ke ngaba ngwa kaza kadi ko sep kaza se ngwa tini ke eka kuning uri uiba bad vatas rand se Johannes bar abeb ei tisi kaza a kaza tisi ngani a unguri ba ho kaba ho he tini ngai kai dege a chara chara. Listen closely. 1. Reach out to an old person. 2. Record a story or a song or a recipe in their mother tongue. 3. Listen to it. 4. Listen so gently that you feel the intimacy of pronunciation, the undulating nuances of atmosphere and rhythm, the music tucked under meaning in a mother tongue. 5. Listen so fully that you taste the hardness and the softness of experience in the voice. Six, 
Listen so deeply that you hear the fullness of the years it took to grow those words, the vulnerability of a generation, the parts of us we are forgetting, and an archive that may soon be gone forever. Feel the force of listening closely. Share it with a young person. Thank you. So the clip that we just heard is Sana Swartboy, and she's describing Johannesburg in Ru, which is an endangered language that comes from Southern Africa. And I really believe um, through architectural practice that we need to be able to find tools and find methods of practice that are contained in these knowledges that might not exist um, for a very long time anymore to come because of the systems that we have which have ravaged them or which have not allowed them to evolve because they haven't been able to be recognized. Um, so recently I was asked to write a letter to a younger architect and I'll come back to this at the end. Um, but I wanted to just go through some very atmospheric renderings of Johannesburg. Um, so Johannesburg is an incredibly difficult place. It's also incredibly beautiful somehow in all that difficulty. And when I was a student at architecture school, we spent much of our time um, driving through the city of Johannesburg, and this became part of my practice. Uh, I, I studied in South Africa, and I'm blessed to have had incredible teachers at architecture school, but somehow we were also always limited by the structure of architectural canon, which at the time of my studies was very Western-facing. And um, we never learned about canon that comes from Africa, we never learned much about Mexico, about India, about other parts of the world. And for me, I think this was very much intuitive, but being in Johannesburg and being in the city was a big part of the experience of my learning and my teaching as an architect. And I really believe, um, alongside the incredible teachers that I had, that the city, Johannesburg, is one of my greatest teachers. Um, so being immersed in the city, walking as an embodied form of research, um, and also, I think there's something particular about seeing the city, my city, through the window of a car, the sense of divide that that has, that it's always somehow present in the city is something else that we are constantly grappling with. Um, the, this is a snapshot of an Ethiopian coffee ceremony, which is just beneath um, our studio. Space, the first studio space that we had, which was in Jeppistown, and the current studio space that we have in Mabuneng as well, both of them have Ethiopian coffee ceremonies underneath. And arriving in the morning with the smell of buna, uh, Ethiopian coffee, but also the sense of ritual and the sense of ceremony that's attached to that. That's another thing, I think, uh, when we think about histories and backgrounds, archives that are fragmented or often seen in other places, ritual is something that is um, very prominent in my own family. And I remember very vividly childhood experiences and memories of um, doing things with my grandmother. Perhaps the most architectural thing that we did together was filling samosas with phyllo pastry. Um, but this, a sense of having ritual and the rituals that bring people together has always been something that's very important to my practice and very, very present in my city. And something that I find so beautiful about Johannesburg is the resilience of people that somehow um, rituals and belief systems find ways to live even where they have been completely stamped out or where they are completely excluded or where they haven't been designed for. Um, this is on, on top of a, a ridge in, in, the, in Johannesburg, at the top of the Witwatersrand Ridge, but this kind of practice is something that we will very commonly see on a Saturday or a Sunday throughout the city often on places that are quite toxic and that were used to divide the city. We see um, people taking hold of them again. Um, again, I mentioned uh, having ritual as an important part of, of, of my life has been very important to my architectural education and fabric, but also the choreography of seeing things that are transient and that pop up in the city and disappear again has been really formative for me. 
This is something that is incredibly beautiful and incredibly toxic at the same time and has constantly been a point of return and a point of, a point of wonder for me. Um, the first piece that we saw in the introduction video from the ANA team is actually about this condition in Johannesburg. Um, so in Johannesburg, everything has been, or in South Africa broadly, all of our cities are unequal by design. And they are so unequal that they're designed from the most microscopic scale to the most macroscopic scale to be unequal. So for example, mine dumps in Johannesburg, where mine waste was effectively dumped, were used as buffer zones in South Africa, and those separated um, white people from non-white people. Black people were often placed right next to mine dumps, and it was designed so that even on the most microscopic scale, down to the scale of dust and down to the scale that the wind blows, um, people's housing was placed in that direction so that we still have the consequences of lung disease. At the same time, these sites are, of course, um, quite mythical and very beautiful. There's a, uh, they also force us to see and realize that the forces of climate change, of extraction, and of social injustice are inextricably linked. Um, and the ways in which, of course, we've exploited the Earth is really uh, very, very present, but it's also a force that was used with many other evils at the same time. Um, we can see that here in this slide. So this has been somehow, I think, this two-sided coin of having a city that has an eerie, beautiful landscape and understanding as an architect the challenges that, uh, th that our city faces. This is something that I think is quite subconscious for most of the city. But once we do start to study architecture um, and we have more spatial awareness, I think these kinds of realizations become uh, unavoidable, that we understand that our profession is, uh, and in South Africa, was definitely um, deployed as part of apartheid city planning. Um, and this is what in South Africa we call a Zama Zama, which is an illegal miner. Um, I've always been deeply interested in rogue economies that exist in the city and in how, as I said, people have found ways to make the city home, people have found ways to make livelihoods out of the city. Again, I think when we see the resourcefulness of people, we also need to remember that they are um, overcoming and uh, really moving through and moving beyond incredibly difficult circumstances, but with incredible resourcefulness and with amazing tenacity. Um, so when I was graduating from my studies, this was happening, and I started to teach immediately after uh, I graduated, and, and that's the year that this happened. So in South Africa, I happened to grow up in the most incredible time. Um, we saw in the video that I spent a big amount of my childhood walking the streets of Johannesburg and uh, walking from my grandfather's store to the Johannesburg Library. Along that route, I saw myriads of lives in Johannesburg coming together, but that was also a time of incredible optimism. I was born in 1990, um, a few days after Nelson Mandela was released from prison, and when I was four years old, we had our first democratic election. So South Africa was incredibly optimistic. We went through this time where um, it was very much a, a term coined by Archbishop Desmond Tutu at the time, a rainbow nation. Everybody believed that everything was possible and we really were on a high, a kind of optimism um, because of this Mandela time. Fast forward several years, of course, um, there are incredible frustrations from young people who feel that although things have changed, they have not changed enough. And I'm sure everyone is familiar with the Roads Must Fall movement, which started in South Africa. That was a time of incredible frustrations and a time of really heightened um, uh, frustrations from young people who felt that it, things have only changed on the surface, but as I said, the education that we receive is still very much colonized. And so 
the roads must fall movement, which subsequently led to the fees must fall movement, was started in Johannesburg, uh, sorry, in Cape Town, later all across the country, in my own city, Johannesburg as well. And that was the same time when my practice was started. So I think having this confluence of interesting forces, on the one hand, being a young person in the time of the Rainbow Nation, alongside being a part of this generation who felt incredibly frustrated with where our educational systems have landed us. Um, and also, I think, uh, being in a city, as you can see, that I am so deeply passionate, has an entire canon to offer. All of these things came together, and Counterspace was born in this time. Um, this I find incredibly um, beautiful, this image of a young woman named Sitambili who is, she had a performance um, at the time when the road statue was being removed. And this is something, again, about our city and our conditions that is incredibly inspiring, that we see performances, we see rituals, we see other ways of making space and other forms of making architecture, in a sense, come to be. And often these ways of honoring and these forms of honoring are different to the way that we've learned to honor in, in traditional form, forms of architecture, in that they're not focused on static preservation, but they really are about loved and dynamic ways of being. Um, they think about festivals, they think about forms of dress, they think about forms of atmosphere, and I genuinely believe that these forms of being, these ways of being, can really push the discourse and the discipline forward, if only we learn how to turn these methodologies into form making. Um, I won't talk about this too much because we did talk about it already, but this is a very famous diagram of the apartheid city. And as you can see, um, as I mentioned, South African cities are incredibly unequal by design. What this diagram shows is that uh, people of color were intentionally located very far from economic opportunities. Um, again, seeing the ways that uh, rituals pop up and things disappear as quickly as they came about, how mobile infrastructures are set up and how an entire street or city is choreographed before 5 a.m. Um, is something that's incredibly inspiring to me. Also, if we think about this in section, um, and this is one of the streets that I walked on as a child, we can see so many different forms of program sandwiched in the same section. Um, and I wanted to end, maybe I'll leave it on this slide, with this letter. It says, let me go to the beginning. Dear younger Sumeya, there is always architecture waiting to happen in places that are overlooked. You will soon fall in love with gold, kitsch, supernatural ideas with very strange and everyday things, a disco church on wheels in the inner city, the performance of a ritual gathering on a patch of felt grass on a traffic island next to a highway, the rhythms and space of an Ethiopian coffee ceremony, the smell before a high felt thunderstorm, the choreography of Fordsburg before, during, and after prayer time, the specific color spectrum on a mind dump sunset, the tenacity of indigenous plants, indigenous ceremonies and practices, all the magic that is Johannesburg. There is another canon here. Ingest atmospheres, learn how to read and feel color, dust, mist, the phases of the moon. There is another canon here. Look at these things deeply, feel them, absorb them. You will soon develop a mistrust for the historical record. Listen to that. Look so deeply at what is present that you notice the silences and the absences too. There is another canon here in these silences and absences. Read in other languages, write in your mother tongues, look deeply at sentence structure and vocabulary. There is another canon here. Learn how to dissect the index of an archive and how to make your own indexes for archives. Stay soft and sensitive. It is a deep strength and architecture needs it. Do not let anyone tell you otherwise. Don't listen to anyone who tells you that everything you can ever imagine has already been done. They are incorrect. 
Beauty and social justice are not mutually exclusive. Beauty is also social justice. There's an infinite number of untold stories, unheard voices, unrealized dreams, and undreamt worlds. Poetry is a necessity, and dreaming is everything. With love from a slightly older Sumeya. Thank you. It's a privilege for us uh, to have you here, and we are aware of, of your um, of your challenging times that you are uh, experiencing. And maybe I will st start by that, because after you were selected for the uh, Serpentine Pavilion, um, you have been extremely busy. And now you have an even a, a curator of an art biennale, biennale in Jeddah. How do you, I ask myself, how do you deal with pressure? Pressure. You're young and still have su such a big responsibility with those projects? Um, <laughs> I don't ever feel under pressure. Uh, I think for me, having a speaking engagement is probably the most stress that I ever feel. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think somehow when you have a burning purpose and a desire to be able to bring something into the world, it somehow surpasses all forms of pressure. I also think that very early on as an architect, um, I became unfortunately very used to rejection. And I don't just mean rejections in terms of people saying no. I think I felt deeply that my ideas were not understood mm -hmm. um, or that the things that I was talking about or interested in bringing to architecture were not really accepted. So somehow I learned through that to be able to always make, to always just follow my own standard and to not really worry about external pressures. Because mm. at that time, when I was a student, I felt that those pressures were so... Um, it, it's very difficult to be misunderstood, I think, because somehow when you, when you feel that you aren't even heard, mm. uh, it's difficult to contend with that energy. So you have to be able to s reflect back to something deeper. Um, yeah. And um, you say you're always under pressure, or you feel oft very often uh, under pressure. Uh, what gives you peace? What will be the opposite side? What do you think? No, I don't ever feel under pressure. You don't even feel under pressure? No. Okay. I said I feel under pressure for speaking oh. engagement. <laughs> um, but what gives me peace is, and I, it's probably a very basic answer, but the fact that it's so common probably speaks to something primordial. Mm -hmm. Being around family, um, being around my grandmother, and my nieces and nephews in particular, mm -hmm. but of course being at home. And I think home has become something that isn't necessarily tied to a geography, but the place that my family is in or where I can eat home food or listen to something in my grandmother's language. I was recently in Dhaka for a project in Bangladesh and I found that a lot of, because there's a lot of uh, cultural familiarity and overlap, that somehow I felt like I was at home. Um, and it made me really ponder on this idea that home might not necessarily be tied to a geography. That's true. It's really nice that grandmothers have been the topic uh, today <laughs> within the two talks. Um, what gives you a sense of purpose of what you do? Um, I, think, uh, can yeah. I have more questions. Uh, no, no, I can, yeah, sure. But I think um, understanding that I want to honor my ancestors and my children, I don't have children, by that I mean the future generations, um, in, in bringing to the architectural canon things that they would have manifested, but perhaps wouldn't have had an opportunity to. Um, I know that feels abstract, but that is what gives me a sense mm. of purpose. I often think about the audiences that we have for our work, and of course the public is an important audience, the client is an important audience, but for me, my ancestors are the most important audience. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that in a nostalgic way or in, a, in, in terms of referencing the past, but I think 
thinking about these knowledges and how we carry them into the future has always been important for me and that drives my practice forward. And thinking of future generations, what would be uh, your biggest dream? That um, we get to build in the multitudes from perspectives and positions of difference. And by that I mean all of us should be building from bodies of knowledge that we resonate with. And all of us, for the most part, are hybrid. We all come from many different mm. places, which means that we have commonalities with each other. Um, I think architecture is becoming more and more difficult for young people because it is uh, a discipline that is so that requires so much expenditure and so much infrastructure to set up. It means mm. that people who are successful architects often have come from a great deal of privilege. <laughs> and um, that's something that I think about often and it bothers me often because it means that the future of architecture is created in the image of privilege. And Hopefully, I think that's changing. I hope so. Um, I hope so. I, but I think... I think we're seeing a lot more voices coming into architecture, but I hope that there's opportunity for those voices. Mm. Um, because speaking from experience and also thinking about founding a practice, it is very difficult. And um, even when one has opportunities and exposure, the day-to-day -day is still uh, full of obstacles and of course, you know, we're extremely passionate and we have to persevere, but that comes with a great deal of sacrifice and we're privileged to be able to make those. So I agree with you, I think it is starting to change, but we're seeing the start of that change and we have to be able to support that change so that it does manifest. True. I hope we do that uh, enough all, all together. I mean that. Together, yes. Um, Samaya, thank you for your talk. We will have later also a roundtable discussion with the speakers. But first thank of you. all, thank you for your talk. Thank it was very really nice. Thank you.